Welcome to this month's Schumann Talk, where we discuss issues we face in Europe today in the light of Robert Schumann's vision for a community of peoples deeply rooted in Christian values. It was on May the 9th, 1950, precisely at 6 p.m., that the French Foreign Minister, Robert Schumann, gave a three-minute speech in which he laid the foundations for the European House, where today 500 million Europeans live together in peace and cooperation. That's what I like to call the defining moment of post-war Europe, for it launched the European movement for peace and unity that has led to today's European Union. And there's been unprecedented peace between EU member states ever since. We find ourselves in a situation right now of war on the eastern edges of Europe. And uh, this is um, part of the bigger picture of uh, that Schumann's vision was for a community of peoples deeply rooted in Christian values. And we're trying to get understanding from the Schumann story on our current situation in Europe today. And today our, our guest comes to us from Romania, Florica Kerikis. Uh, she was a member of the Romanian parliament for two terms from 2012 to 2020 um, and is still um, uh, involved in the political world from the outside. And so we're very pleased to have uh, Florica involved uh, with us today. Welcome, Florica, from Aradia. That's the top left-hand corner, if you look at the map of Romania, um, just across the border, say, from Hungary. Uh, and uh, does it also border Ukraine right there at Aradia? Hi, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, dialogue. Um, now uh, we have only uh, the border with Hungary. It's uh, about 10 minutes uh, far away. Yeah. How far away is the border with Ukraine from you? 200 it's kilometers? About, uh, it's about uh, 200 kilometers in the north. Yes. Okay. Yes, so uh, you're, you're much closer to the current situation than... I am, for example, here in the Netherlands. Thank you, yes. Florica, so much for uh, agreeing to, to to be with us today on the Schumann Talk. I first heard you tell your story at the European Prayer Breakfast nine or ten years ago, uh, a very um, challenging story. And that, that's where we want to begin. Um, you you had some, uh, you were happily married to a musician, uh, and then tragedy struck. Um, Tell us about that. Uh, yes, uh, my life was uh, full of full of uh, ups and downs. Uh, in uh, at the beginning of 1991, so this is 33 years ago, uh, I was happily married to a cello player, a music professor, uh, had uh, two kids, um, and uh, I was an engineer mechanical engineer, but uh, from March till September in that year, everything that was balanced in my life um, fall apart because um, in, in March I lost my husband. Uh, I, I lost my, uh, my job as an engineer. In the summer, I uh, got pregnant with our third child. I was worried about what will happen, if we'll have enough uh, uh, means to raise another child. Uh, I couldn't find a job. But in September 27, uh, I got uh, the terrible news that uh, my husband was killed in a car accident while he was uh, driving back from uh, concerts that he had in uh, Holland, uh, Belgium and Sweden for the last uh, two months of his life. He was accompanied by uh, a friend, uh, a new friend that he had at that time, Ken Tucker, an American piano player who after this moved and still lives in uh, Romania. Uh, that moment, December, um, September 27, uh, 1991, found me uh, being unemployed 
with uh, no income, nothing, pregnant in five months with the third child, in a house that we bought a year, a year before, we still had some debts for it. And uh, very desperate because I thought that I lose, I lost everything that I had and uh, um, I was uh, always supporting my husband. He was uh, also choir director of the big choir of the church, but also professor and choir director in the high school. And he also um, started the music faculty within the Christian Baptist University that we have in Oradea. Uh, he admitted the first 10 students, but he could never uh, teach them because uh, he died uh, three days before the school year started. So that was the deepest valley uh, of my life. And um, I realized at that time that uh, I really have to fight to keep my Christian faith, my faith in God. I really had to force myself to believe that God keeps his promises, that when he promised to be close for the, to the widow and the orphans, he really meant it. And um, uh, I don't know how, I just felt encouraged to read Psalm 34, loud voice. And it was so inappropriate to read that I will glorify uh, the Lord uh, every time because I thought that it's not fair to praise God when I was in that desperate situation. But then in the Psalm 34, later on, it says that many times the sorrow and the pain comes in the life of the righteousness, but God is always helping the believer go through. And uh, I read this for, uh, for some months. First, loud voice with everything crying inside me and uh, in a way not agreeing with what I read. But then uh, every day I experience God's care and the provision and love. And uh, it was easier for me to read until I felt that it's okay to uh, read it um, uh, not with loud voice. And um, God gave me the, the courage to start something new and accept a big challenge uh, at that time for me to completely change my uh, career. And uh, um, just a week after I buried my husband at the beginning of October, I uh, became a block flute, a recorder teacher at the university for those students that my husband admitted. Mm -hmm. At that time, uh, block flute was not an instrument um, known and used much in Romania, and he wanted to introduce it. And uh, he even um, uh, wrote um, a book to teach uh, how to play a uh, recorder. And uh, I used that book and um, I, uh, I accepted this because my husband wanted me to, to do this. And I accepted when he told me, counting on him that he will replace me while I will be a little bit busy with the new baby, but uh, also helping me to enter the school system in Romania. I realized that um, in all that unemployment period, I couldn't find a job, so I thought that um, I have to put bread on the table for my children, and uh, I accepted and I prayed God to help me um, fulfill my uh, commitments for this. Um, and um, if you want, I can continue a little bit with uh, the ups and downs in the career-wise. Well, this is 1991 still, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and Romania had, had just um, be, uh, moved away from a dictatorship at the end of 1989. Uh, the world remembered, if we're Correct. old enough, um, 
the demise of, uh, of your dictator, Ceausescu, and his wife. Uh, very dramatic scenes on television around Christmas time. Um, a, a wonderful uh, uh, revolution that took place, starting uh, with the story of the of the uh, uh, the, the pastor from Timisoara, Las Catocas, um, whose congregation gathered around him um, when he was being threatened with uh, being arrested, and uh, how that that led to a swelling movement. Um, centered in Timisoara, and eventually, within a few days, actually, um, the president was overthrown. So Romania was still in a very fragile situation at the end of 1991. Um, so in, in order for us to understand how fragile your personal situation was, you, you, you've lost your job, you've just lost your husband, and all the emotional upheaval that's involved, you're expecting a a baby, you have this offer for a job. Um, now, I've introduced you as a politician or a former politician. That's a big jump from teaching recorder to <laughs> um, becoming a politician. Tell us how, how that came about. Uh, I taught recorder for uh, four years until uh, they told me that I should uh, do the music faculty myself because my engineering diploma is not enough for the accreditation because we were entering, you know, uh, uh, all these uh, principles and the rules that uh, we had to do things differently. And um, uh, I didn't want to do that, but uh, somebody offered me a job to start translating from English and uh, i accepted it uh, that was the first time when um, i learned how to use a computer and uh, the teacher was uh, my oldest son he was about uh, i don't know 12 13 he was a teenager but it looks like he was born with a computer in his hands <laughs> and um, he taught me he was a very severe professor to me but uh, it was uh, good and uh, i could stay uh, at home and uh, work from home and I did this, this for uh, four years. Uh, now, on a, a family side, two years after my first husband death, I remarried. And that was a really miracle from God because um, I didn't think, I didn't plan for it, but God had his plans to give my children a new father and uh, to give me a husband. And... Uh, uh, I married somebody who was in my church, who was close to my family, and um, he was not married before, five years younger. So um, we had lots of preconceived ideas about this, but we felt that God really wants this for us. And um, we married, and um, uh, some years after, uh, God gave us a child together, the fourth child that I had, a daughter. So I have two boys and two girls now. And um, uh, after being, uh, so after working for four years as a recorder teacher, four years as a translator, I was at home with my baby girl for two years. This is the maternity leave in Romania. And then for an entire year, I couldn't find a job again. So I was second time in my life unemployed. Uh, at the end of this year, so after two years of just being uh, a full-time mom and housewife, I uh, got um, a very challenging uh, offer to start uh, an institution. And um, I accepted it. Um, it was uh, to register a microfinance institution. It was aimed to be a program for development small businesses of women and family businesses, especially targeting the women at risk. And when I heard this, I just identified myself with the target group and I said, okay, I think that this is now the payback time. God is giving me the opportunity to encourage other women to trust themselves, to trust God and to work hard for achieving their objectives because many of them had uh, very difficult situations in their homes. So um, um, I uh, 
uh, I accepted this. We started to teach uh, business to um, to give micro loans, to give consulting, and this is what I did for twelve years. After eight years, I got the invitation to go into politics. Now, when we, it, before we get into that, Florica, you, did you say women at risk? Yes. Now, what do you mean by that? What kind of situation? What kind of risk? You had experienced that yourself. Uh, you'd be yes. very vulnerable. Um, what kind of risks were the, are these women facing? Uh, it was... Um, they were women with um, um, alcoholic husbands or uh, unemployed or women who lost their husbands by uh, death or divorce so single mothers uh, they were women with uh, a very low income that needed to provide for their children uh, all kind of situations or very poor families in oradia uh, my hometown and uh, in the county, it was very, um, very important for them to to teach how to do business because they were women who already started something, but um, uh, they started without having any knowledge of business, business planning, cash flow prediction, and all these things. Uh, or they were women who we're considering starting a business and uh, we help them um, do it uh, well and even when we determine together the size of the loan we help them uh, make the best decisions for them and for their businesses i hired uh, women that were uh, sharing my christian values and principles who uh, were very close to our clients and we developed friendship relationships. Although, I mean, we were a very unusual lending um, uh, entity. So you, you saw this as, uh, as a God redeeming the pain, the vulnerability you'd personally gone through. You realized now you were in a position to help others who were facing pain and, and uh, vulnerability. Um, and then came along this, this invitation to get involved in politics. Um, wasn't politics something rather frowned upon by Christians in Romania? Uh, people said, well, politics is a dirty business, so Christians shouldn't be involved. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, politics and uh, Christianity were somehow considered incompatible. And uh, I had uh, I heard pastors preaching against being in business or being in politics. While I was uh, director of Integra Romania Association, I uh, solved the conflict in my mind about uh, being a Christian in business and considering uh, business uh, as a marketplace and uh, uh, you know how to uh, do business without selling you a soul. Now. Uh, when I was invited to enter in politics after being quite visible in the community through the activities because I didn't stop myself only to this lending and consulting businesses but also I developed all kind of uh, projects, uh, training programs for youth, for uh, people in agriculture. Uh, I learned how to write uh, grant proposals to different donors so uh, I was pretty, pretty visible and uh, uh, this is how um, um, I got in politics somehow because I was um, invited uh, in 2008 by the candidate that uh, had the biggest chances to become the mayor and he became the mayor uh, to enter. Uh, the invitation came to the leaders of my church and I was recommended by the leaders of my church. That was something very new, mm -hmm. uh, never done before. And uh, I didn't think that at the beginning when I first heard this, I, I laughed, I have to be honest, because I thought that uh, uh, my church is too conservative for uh, uh, nominating a woman uh, to represent uh, the Baptist Church. 
uh, I never considered going into politics until that moment. And I really prayed and I asked my friends to pray to uh, for God to give me um, a clear message if I should go or not. And I really understood that politics is a better way of serving my community, of serving the people, being close to the people, to listen to their needs, while in politics, being in the city council, you had the means to answer some of these needs and to, to participate in the development of your community, uh, putting in practice the principles and the values that you have. So teaching the recorder, then after that you moved into all these developments of, of training programs. So it wasn't such a big jump. Uh, in, in fact, um, it, it was <laughs> you, you were seeing a bigger picture of well, what is God's purposes for society as a whole, and um, that resolved the question for you, you know, whether or not Christians could be involved in politics. Um, and uh, uh, here I would like to add that. You know, I studied the Bible in the last year. So since that moment in 2008, I studied the Bible and read uh, books about how is to be in politics as a Christian. And um, I have some lessons that I learned from this uh, studying. Uh, first, I learned that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Yes. He wouldn't mind uh, using the genius people, I guess. But uh, he's using the people who are available to his call. Mm -hmm. Also, I learned that uh, uh, the faith of the people used by God was first tested. And they went all through very difficult uh, trials. And I could mention just a few uh, very significant examples like uh, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Daniel, Esther, Deborah, Paul in the New Testament. Um, I realized at that moment that with all the pain and the suffering that I went through, God wanted to prepare me for something uh, bigger. He wanted to test my faith because when you are deep down, and God comes and rescues you, you fear nothing. I mean, you don't fear the people, you fear only God, and you trust God because he is always capable to help you. And this is how I approach this new challenge and all the challenges that came after. Uh, this is how I, I mean, recognizing that everything I am and I do and I say is from God uh, makes me very dependent on him and on prayer. And this was uh, my, my, the way that I was involved in politics since then. And I really consider politics as a ministry. And you can uh, have a call for being in the politics because it means that you have a call to serve the people. Well, tell us about your uh, different phases of being involved in politics. You talked about how the, the mayoral candidate uh, invited you uh, to get involved in politics. What did that lead to? Um, that lead that at the, at the end of the four years uh, mandate as a uh, city council member, I, uh, I became, uh, I was appointed uh, deputy mayor that was in 2020, uh, 2012. Of Oradia. Uh, in Oradia, yes. That how was big is Oradia? Oradia? Give us an Oradia idea. Is, uh, about 200,000 citizens. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it started to grow and develop a lot since uh, we had uh, this mayor. He was mayor for three mandates. And now his disciple is the mayor and he became the president of the county council. But uh, lots of development happened since uh, then. I'm very happy and honored that I was part of that team. Then in 2012, at the end of the year, we had the uh, uh, parliamentarian elections. And, um, 
Yes, and uh, I was um, um, selected to to go and to run for the parliament. Um, I uh, accepted again, not trusting me and my experience because I didn't have experience in that, but uh, trusting uh, God uh, that He will help me. And very interesting. Um, while I was uh, director of Integra Romania and city council member, I did also a master degree in uh, social economy here at the University of Oradea. Uh, and I was part uh, in uh, European funded uh, projects uh, with the Ministry of uh, Labor to, um, to draft two important laws in Romania, the law of the microfinance institution and the law of the social economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so interesting that I consider these uh, two projects as previews of what uh, I became after uh, that. So I had this very little experience in uh, uh, law drafting, uh, but I went again with the desire, strong desire of serving uh, my nation this time, and also taking the needs uh, of the local community and uh, uh, see how I could uh, help um, uh, those needs uh, by my presence in the parliament. I was a member of the education committee. I was uh, vice president of that committee. And uh, I had uh, as a very important um, uh, project there to develop the vocational training. Uh, based on the experience that I had in the city council with all the investors, the private sector that came and uh, were very happy for the terms that we had for them uh, to invest in Oradia, but asking us about uh, how they will uh, be able to find the labor force. And we realized that we really need to develop this vocational training. So I took some initiatives in this. Uh, also, based on my um, experience, um, my personal experience of uh, re being remarried, of my first three children being adopted by my husband, I really was very sensitive to all the problems of children, uh, foster care and adoption. And I had uh, several um, initiatives in uh, improving these laws and making them more, um, um, uh, how to say, um, uh, better uh, for the goal that they had, which is to provide an abandoned child a family as quickly as possible and uh, permanently if uh, possible. So uh, this was, um, they were very, very important. All the family issues. We also had the referendum for family in my second mandate when we tried to uh, introduce in the constitution of Romania the definition of the family as being the union be between a man and a woman. Unfortunately, it didn't pass because of many reasons. Um, but um, I uh, had lots of uh, uh, initiatives that uh, passed, uh, even if they had my name or not, it didn't matter. Uh, some were just included in some other initiatives, but I was happy that the laws were improved in order to uh, help more children to be adopted, also help uh, the children when they become mature and they have to exit the uh, state institutions, how they will get uh, uh, absorbed and how they will integrate in the society. Um, and uh, also I had, uh, I, I had different initiatives based on the needs. Uh, I was always very close to the people. I mean, I, I was uh, uh, open to discuss with people. I, I was uh, managing the uh, all the social media and everything by myself because i wanted to see the people talk to the people and um, one law that i created from scratch uh, it was to combat the most allergenic plant in romania this was based on the many people who came to me 
asking me to do something about it because they were suffering a lot for many months every year and um, we didn't have anything in the law to combat this so now the law is there for about six years still we fight about implementing it but uh, it's better every year yes now so, you, you you described your own personal trauma um, that in some in the long run actually qualified you uh, you talked about the training programs that you developed long before you got involved in politics and then your your uh, local politi political involvement you see these is all preparation um, for for your national role um, and then you talk about the family and your particular situation um, marrying a second husband who had to adopt your children all of these things you look back and you see how they were being woven uh, into a purpose for the role of politics and we, we can see in the picture uh, up by your left shoulder there a, a picture of the family perhaps uh, let, let's talk about your current family now not only have you become a, a, a wife and a mother but you're a grandmother um so are these your two youngest grandchildren or have you had some since then oh i had lots of them since then these are the oldest now uh, because uh, right now I have uh, nine grandchildren and the 10th is coming in April. Uh, three of my children are married and uh, my youngest uh, daughter, this is a picture uh, taken four years ago. Uh, my um, uh, oldest daughter lives in the States and she has four children, including twins. Uh, so we have um, a very interesting and very balanced family, by the way. I have... Uh, uh, four children, two boys, two girls, and uh, now with the tenth uh, girl that is coming, we'll have uh, uh, five boys and five girls as grandchildren. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I am so happy. My boys uh, live in uh, Cluj, which is about 150 kilometers from here, but uh, we see each other quite a lot. But um, I was this, um, how to say, this modern grandma. I mean, uh, Skype type and uh, other things thank god for uh, these uh, possibilities to connect to each other because um, uh, i was very much away i mean first uh, uh, for the first uh, four years of my uh, involvement in oradia i was at home uh, very busy but uh, after this i was um, uh, away in Bucharest for eight years as a member of parliament and um, after uh, two mandates in the uh, parliament I was uh, also uh, appointed uh, secretary of state I was the national the president of the national authority for persons with disabilities children and adoption a very complicated um, institution, a very sensitive, uh, hard work. I mean, I worked for about 14 uh, hours every day because uh, we had lots of things to do. And uh, I am very happy uh, for the things that I could do, the reforms um, uh, in the uh, child protection and also care for the people with disabilities. I told you that uh, as a member of parliament, I had initiatives about foster care and uh, adoption uh, laws. And now very interesting that um, I had uh, the privilege of uh, being in the executive when I had to draft the methodology on how to apply these laws. And um, uh, we were in communication with all the counties because all the uh, social protection institutions from uh, Romania were in our coordination, uh, both uh, state owned and private ones. We uh, also gave licenses to the private ones. Um, and um, I was in permanent contact with them. Um, and making sure that um, uh, the foster care centers will uh, be uh, shut down. Uh, we don't, I mean, 
maybe we have very, very few uh, foster care centers in uh, Romania right now, um, but uh, because I didn't check the latest numbers, but uh, they will disappear completely. And uh, the maximum number of uh, children in an institution is 12. And this is a uh, house. Uh, it's, a, it's a form of institution that is family uh, uh, type. And uh, the children up to seven, they cannot go into an institution, but they have to be raised in a foster care family or uh, maternal assistance. And both in the uh, regarding the care for the for the people with disabilities, I um, put in place some reforms about uh, integrating those people in the community. Uh, something also very very hard that was the um, changing mentality of the society regarding this, because these people are disconsidered but uh, they may lack the possibility of walking or doing some things but uh, uh, there are very many intelligent people there uh, who just lack opportunities and who need support and uh, all kind of assistive devices and all these things so i was really very busy and um, i i really like this hard work uh, for a year so florica to get some perspective <clears throat> Can, let's tell us a little bit about um, before the end of communism, uh, Romania was well known for the large numbers of orphanages, uh, Ceausescu's policy there. What has changed? Uh, in those times, abandoned children and uh, people with disabilities were put in... Um, uh, institutions that uh, were in remote areas because they were considered as, um, I don't know, secondhand persons or something like this. Um, nobody knew about them. We didn't have, I mean, uh, beginning of the 90 uh, year, 1990, when we saw images in the TV about the situation in our orphanage, we were equally shocked like all the Europe and all the world because we didn't see those children. And uh, the people that work in these institutions were strictly forbidden to speak about this. And of course, we didn't have mobile phones at that time, so they will take uh, pictures. We didn't have uh, all that uh, freedom of speech. We didn't have all those things. And it was considered like... Uh, um, it's normal. I mean, the personnel that was working with those uh, babies and children in the orphanages were instructed not to hug the children, uh, not to show them affection because uh, they could become dependent and uh, then they will disturb the personnel and they don't have time and uh, you should raise them uh, in a different way. So imagine uh, how how uh, brutal this uh, this was. Also, people with disabilities were hundreds of people in an institution, and they were they are you know like just plants. I mean, you water the plants and uh, keep them alive. Uh, something similar happened to those people. Uh, so um, to make the reform in these two areas takes a lot of time. Takes um, uh, changing the mentality of both people in this situation and the families and uh, the community. Um, thank God that uh, with the accession in the European Union, Romania was um, uh, also uh, forced to uh, implement uh, <clears throat> these reforms, but also helped in two ways by uh, having models and we had a lot of transfer of knowledge about uh, these uh, things from uh, institutions in different countries. Um, and uh, this transfer happened through projects that was uh, internationally funded uh, and allowed uh, um, trips, visits to go and see and then come back and apply. 
but also very important, the European Union also provided funds for well-written projects that will show the progress after uh, using those money, uh, having uh, the right model in place. So um, uh, now uh, we are much better off. Uh, of course, that there is still uh, a way to go, but uh, we are much better. And it's realistic. We we cannot be we cannot compare the situation with the situation in Netherlands, in Germany, in other places where uh, it was no communism, in where uh, principles, uh, values were different, uh, not affected by the communist regime. Um, but I think that we are much better now. Yes. Now, um, when you look back. Uh, on your involvement in politics, you, you, you've had a lot of connection with interesting people. Um, for example, uh, the president of uh, Romania, President Johannes, um, we, you uh, came across, I came across this photo of you, I think, uh, giving an award to the president or was he giving you an award? What, what was going on here? Um, one of my, uh function in my party was uh, to be the president of the women organization of uh, the National Liberal Party, Penele, uh, and uh, that was from uh, uh, 2017 to 2023, so until last year. And uh, we organized uh, a gala in 2019, just before the presidential election. And uh, I offered uh, Mr. President uh, an award. And um, uh, he was just uh, one of the persons uh, to receive an award. But uh, we awarded the excellency. And uh, we got uh, 10 uh, women from different uh, fields, from different uh, places in Romania that were uh, presented as uh, role models for the society. They were excellent in what uh, they do. Professor, doctor, artist, uh, I don't know, different, uh, even uh, a woman with disability who is uh, in a wheelchair, but very active in uh, motivating others and uh, uh, changing mentality of Romanians regarding people with disability. It was a very, very nice event that we did in Sibiu, the hometown of uh, Mr. President Johannes. Now, I have another photo of you um, in the People's Palace, so-called People's Palace, that huge building that Ceausescu uh, built. And uh, there you're seated at this, um, I, I recognize this, this, this uh, scene because it's a large round table. Um, I, I guess it must seat at least 60 people. Uh, and there you are on the left and you are with a, an Asian delegation. Tell us about that. Um, yes, um, as member of parliament, I was uh, in a friendship committees with different countries, one of them being South Korea. And uh, the man that is uh, next to me, uh, South Korean, he is um, a good friend. He lives in Romania for uh, several years now. Uh, he's a pastor, but also a business person. And uh, he makes lots of connections with uh, South Koreans, uh, investors, uh, Christians, uh, different uh, people. And uh, we had the meeting here. I was also uh, the president of the ecumenical prayer group uh, of the Romanian parliament. We have this group since 93, I guess, in parliament. And um, I was uh, part of this group since uh, first day in parliament. I knew about it. But uh, for a number of years, I was also the president and I organized uh, this uh, um, exchange. Uh, um, I mean, we didn't go, they went, but they came to visit us. But I was, uh, once I was uh, in South Korea, in Seoul, and I participated to their uh, prayer breakfast. Uh, because uh, we also had in our in one of our prayer breakfast we had a delegation of uh, about 30 uh, people from South Korea and um, I also participated in uh, international conference in Vienna with people from South Korea and uh, Japan um, uh, to 
speak about the situation with abduction um, from the people that were abducted from South Korea and Japan uh, by the people, by the leadership of uh, North Korea. So I was involved in lots of different uh, activities, political, but also, but um, what is important to mention is that um, I was involved in uh, in projects that uh, were in connection with people, serving the people, helping the vulnerable people, because I think that this is what we we uh, need to do uh, as Christians. And uh, uh, you know um, uh, the verse in Matthew six: "For where your treasure is, uh, there will your heart be also." So. Uh, vulnerable people were always on my uh, heart uh, and um, you know when I when I entered uh, a city council and I became the president of the social committee in the city council I remember and I put it as a job description for me uh, the verse from Micah 6 uh, 8 uh, he has shown you a mortal what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Mm -hmm. So this is what I uh, uh, was very determined to do, to, to act justly, to love the people, my neighbor, and uh, to be humble and recognize that uh, God is um, in all I do and in all I am. I mean, there is this temptation uh, for people in politics to consider that uh, they deserve to be there because yes. they work hard or uh, they uh, uh, put a lot of money or they have the experience the knowledge the whatever um i never considered this although i say it's tempting i mean everybody speaks to you very respectfully and you are mrs president of that or that um, no, I I um, I recognized all was, and I I did it publicly. Uh, all the people knew my story, uh, not because I wanted all to know my story, but because it was the best way to introduce Jesus and my personal faith in Him, uh, because uh, they um, uh, people had to understand uh, what motivates me and uh, what makes me the person i am and i was that scripture from micah 6 8 is an excellent one uh for christians considering being involved uh -huh. in politics uh, the reason why i i recognize that photo of you with the koreans uh i recognize that hall is that you um very much helped us with the schumann center to organize the state of europe forum uh, in 2019, I think it was, um, the year that uh, Romania held the presidency of the EU. And uh, you were able to get us access uh, to that same hall where we, where we held the, uh, uh, a number of the sessions of, the, uh, of the, the forum then. And I was very grateful for your assistance. Uh, but you have presented a picture here of... Um, uh, being involved in politics to help the vulnerable, um, not of one of power and, and serving your own self and your own name. And uh, I think this is a very different picture than a lot of people have of, um, uh, of what politics is all about. Um, for young people wanting to, to serve God in the public sphere, what would be your advice there are many places where people can go and get trained if they want to um, uh, become a pastor and have a role in the church. But where can people get trained in a biblical way um, if they want to serve the Lord in the public square? And you told us about your own story. Um, what kind of training would you have liked to have had before you got thrown in the deep end, as it were? Uh, yeah, good question. I uh, felt several times uh, the need of getting some training or advice uh, on things uh, that uh, were connected to my political involvement. Uh, but I realized that 
it is very difficult to find the right people or contacts to find this because uh, uh, some missed uh, uh, the political context and understanding, some missed the Christian uh, one. So I had to learn it by myself. I mean, uh, I started over for uh, seven times uh, in my professional life and I always had to learn it by myself. Yes. And uh, my uh, recipe for uh, doing this and being successful in this is uh, to have faith in God, uh, which means uh, God is the one that opened this door and provided this opportunity, to have trust in myself that I'm capable of doing it, and then work hard. So faith, trust, and work, hard work. Um, and this is why, uh, since I uh, became a politician, I started to speak uh, everywhere I could, in all the places um, where it was open for me to speak about this, churches, uh, youth meetings, groups, uh, individuals, about uh, the necessity for Christians to go into politics, because uh, we are called by God to be salt and light but light is seen only in the darkness. So, you know, it's nice, easy to be a Christian in the church, but uh, how difficult it is so many times to be a good Christian and uh, stay uh, true to your values when you are in a dark place, like uh, a hard business or politics. Um, and uh, also, uh, we need to be the salt that... Uh, uh, the world needs to preserve and to develop. And this is very, very important to act uh, like this. Uh, this is why, for instance, last year, I accepted the challenge of um, leading the political and society network of the Romanian Leadership Forum. Uh, it is quite hard. It is, it is a challenge for me. Uh, we had our first meeting in November, and uh, we are planning uh, the activities for uh, this year. Uh, but I really believe that it will be a good uh, place where people uh, could learn uh, from uh, people with more experience or from each other. Because in November, we had people from five different parties, different denominations, evangelical Christians, that uh, shared uh, life experiences in politics and it was wonderful. We didn't uh, put it on social media, we didn't uh, promote it because it was not for that. It was just to mm -hmm. be together, uh, brothers and sisters, and to learn from each other and uh, encourage each other. Um, I always encourage the young people first to grow in their relationship with God uh, be uh, active members in the church and become the best they could in their field. I mean, to be in politics means that you have some experience in a field and you offer this experience to the community. You want to serve the community through what you know. Of course, that there is not a very clear job description and uh, you learn lots of things by doing, by accepting new challenges, but um, you need to have something, uh, not only the uh, politics, you need to know something, to, to, to be very good in something, because the world needs competent leaders, uh, able to form and to work in a team. Uh, leaders who uh, get the respect of the people, not by an authoritative uh, attitude, but uh, by being a servant uh, leader. Uh, also, the young people, I, I tell them about the temptations that exist around them. Uh, and uh, everybody say that there are three main categories, uh, money, power and sex and uh, they have to be prepared for resisting them. They must have uh, strong families who um, are behind them and support them. I couldn't do what I did if my family would not uh, support me. 
I had the understanding of my family, the sacrifice of my family, especially in the last year. Okay, we were just three. My youngest uh, still uh, uh, lives with us. She's a student. But um, uh, they had to do everything at home. I came only for one day at home and I was pretty much absent because I was harassed sometimes by the press with a new scandal or something. And I was like a, like a guest in my house. You know, I was so much involved in my work. My family understood, accepted this and worked hard to uh, do whatever it takes to, uh, for the house. So um, uh, it's very important also for them to, to be humble, as I said, about the humility and humbleness and the recognition of God as the provider of wisdom and uh, knowledge. Role models. Are there particular heroes in the political area that have been uh, an encouragement and an inspiration for you? Yes. You know, uh, Jesus said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and who want to be first must be your slave. So this is these are the leaders that the world needs. And of course, that some people say, no, uh, they are not followed by people. You need uh, you need uh, leaders with strong voice. Uh, uh, who, when they get the power, everybody will see and uh, they will fear them. I don't believe in this style of leadership. They may be effective for uh, a while, but not for long term. And, um, you know, a year ago, no, almost two years ago now, I uh, came back. I, um, I, I. Um, uh, it, it was a political change. It was uh, the division of the authority that I led. Uh, they were created two uh, different national authorities, one for children with disabilities, one for uh, adult uh, children, and one for adults with disabilities. And uh, when this happened and it was offered to me to come and uh, uh, lead uh, one of them, I uh, preferred not to do it because um, um, I didn't like the new context and I prefer to stay true to my uh, principles and uh, not accept uh, any compromise uh, regarding my principles. And uh, I said, no, thank you. It's preferable to live in full glory, being regretted. Anyway, I was um, already reached the pension uh, uh, age, so uh, now I'm a young pensioner, but uh, very, very active as always. Yes. Now, you talked about servant leadership. Are there any particular servant leaders that have inspired you? Uh, yes. And um, uh, one is uh, the mayor, the one that... Um, um, invited me to go in politics uh, first and he gave me his full trust even if he didn't know me he said that uh, being recommended by the leaders of my church uh, whom he knew and trusted uh, and after me telling him my personal story he said that he would be uh, very pleased and honored to have me in his team um, i learned a lot from him he's an orthodox christian a man with uh, very strong principles. His uh, leadership style is a little bit different, but he's a man of uh, vision. He really cares for he, for people, even if from outside you see him as a very determined man and uh, um, not so uh, sensitive, but he is. People who know him better uh, know him uh, and his sensitive sensitivity and his determination to do good for the community because the role of the uh, leaders in politics and of leaders in general is to uh, build the common good mm -hmm. and this is something that uh, uh, some people don't understand how important it is to build the common good and not look for my personal good when i am in uh, politics or in a leadership position so this is one I also um, grew up in my church with um, very, very 
uh, important uh, Christian leaders. Uh, Joseph Tsun was one of them, uh, Livio Ola, uh, then Paul Negrutz, uh, Peter Vidu, lots of people um, from uh, whom I uh, learned a lot. Uh, I also I studied when I was at the um, Mechanic University in Cluj. Uh, I, uh, I had Bible studies with great leaders uh, that helped me put the foundation of my faith. And uh, with all the trials that I went through, uh, God was uh, my perfect uh, example of uh, leader. And I tried to um, get inspired from him as much as I could. And uh, I didn't really care for what people thought about some uh, things. If I knew that this is from God and this is what I should do, I just uh, went for it and uh, did it. Thank you, Florica. Thank you, too, for sharing about the, uh, the need to serve the common good, because sometimes as Christians, we can think we're in there just for the Christian cause, but not for uh, justice for all and the common good. Uh, thank you, too, Florica, for all you have shared of your own personal story, which in turn uh, will be an inspiration. You'll be a role model, um, and you are already for, for younger people. And, uh, and I just want to thank you very much for your faithfulness through thick and thin, uh, serving God and serving the people. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk with you this day. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.